Hello, my wonderful listeners, and welcome to this week's Catamania episode. In this episode, I had a chat with Gina Bontempo, who has a background in all things related to wellness, fitness, taking care of yourself, motherhood, and she also shared her story, which many of you know, I love discussing the subject lately, uh, of being on birth control. I'm not going to give too much away, but I think, especially for, you know, my my female followers who are mothers or are thinking of becoming mothers, you will find this episode really inspiring and filled with lots of great information. Gina is a very outspoken woman about many issues, and a lot of the stuff that she talks about, I really resonate with, and I know that you will too. I also realized after recording the episode, in case you thought that I have all my act together at all times, that um, I actually recorded it with the wrong microphone. I put this microphone over here, thinking that it will just automatically pick up my voice, but I forgot to change the settings. So I'm hoping that the sound is not too bad on my end. I know Gina's sound will be fine, but yeah, kind of a bit of a F up from my end. Anyways, (laughs) hoping that it'll be okay. So without further ado, give it up for Gina Bontempo. If you enjoyed this episode and you enjoy my podcast, as per usual, please give it five stars, thumbs up, share it with a friend, whatever the like button and support that you could give. It is greatly appreciated. It means more than you know. And stay blessed. Welcome to Ketamania, Gina. Hi, thank you for having me. Thanks, thanks for thanks for being here. Where, so you mentioned a little bit, but just for our audience, um, you know, where are you from um, and where are you based? Yeah, right now I live in Middle Tennessee. Uh, We're about 30 to 45 minutes outside of Nashville. I grew up in South Georgia, so not too far away from here. But before we lived here, we were moving around quite a bit, quite a bit. We were in San Francisco for a little bit and we were in the DC, Virginia area before we came here. So we're very happy to be in the state of Tennessee now. I've heard nothing but amazing things about Tennessee. I'm yet to visit, but I've yeah. heard like all the check marks. People are supposed to be really nice. Um, like musical scene is supposed to be amazing. Just, just really great things all around. It's great. It's very family oriented, which is great. I mean, there, there are definitely some downsides that it's, it's harder to find healthy food options here, as you can imagine okay. in the South. Yeah. The sort of Southeast area of the States is, it's known for not having the healthiest food. So especially coming from somewhere like California, where you walk outside, you can go to any health food shop or any healthy restaurant. Coming back to the South, you're really reminded that it's just a little bit of a different culture here, and especially in terms of food. But it's changing. There's a lot more people moving here. A lot of people moving here from California too, which is good and bad. Um, but it's it's a really good place to raise young children because there's a really strong homeschooling community here. There's a lot of young parents that have wanted to escape the more crazy parts of the country. So overall, it's it's a really, really great place to be. Right. And you are a new mother, is that correct? Like a new-ish kind of? Yes, I, I would definitely still say new. My daughter just turned two. We're expecting a second. Um, in May of next year. So, oh, amazing! <laughs> yeah. Congrats. So we're. Thank you. I still still consider myself a new mom with the toddler phase. You just time flies. It feels like the last two years has. It's been the longest two years of my life, but also the shortest. But right. you, you're so you're still so new and young in motherhood when the kids are this young. So, I still feel like a new mom, even though learning a lot every day. I'm going to say this, and I keep meeting women to to whom I say this to because, but if this is what motherhood looks like, (laughs) sign me up kind of thing. You know what I mean? (laughs) It's great. No, I mean, look, I will say in the early months, it's really hard because everyone says going from zero to one is the hardest versus going from one to two or two to three, whatever, because it is a huge change. You have to overhaul your entire life. And I always tell young women, I think we should be more honest with young women about how much early motherhood takes out of you because it does take a lot, but it is temporary. It is, trust me, it's temporary. The first year especially can feel very jarring and it can feel um, disorienting and you really do have to reconcile with the fact that you have to surrender and sacrifice so much of your body, so much of your time, especially if you're exclusively breastfeeding in the first several months of the baby's life. It's just such a big commitment. But 
it is temporary. Then, you know, the baby will breastfeed less and then the baby will sleep more. And, you know, my daughter, knock on wood, she's been sleeping great for the past year, over probably a year and a half now. So you get back to a place where you feel more like yourself. But it is awesome. Motherhood's amazing. Um, lots of sacrifices, but it's really, really wonderful. They say it's the most rewarding thing you'll ever do. And it kind of makes sense, right? It is. Yeah, it is. I mean, I... I was really nervous about being a mom. I always knew I wanted to be a mom. I was nervous because I really value me time. I think everyone does, but I think I'm I'm a particularly independent person. I like to do my own thing. You know, I've always been into fitness. I was teaching fitness for a long time. I like to go work out. If I want to spend two hours at, you know, the gym and grocery shopping and doing whatever what I want to, whatever I want to do out. I like having that independence. Um, so I was nervous because I was like, what if I don't really love being a mom? What if I, I don't like this sacrifice I have to make, but it was for me, I felt really blessed that I felt very connected with my daughter as soon as she was born. Um, every mom has different experiences. I hear from a lot of moms that feel they almost feel guilty because it takes them a couple of weeks or even a couple of months to feel very, very bonded to their child. And that's okay. Everyone has a different a different experience in early motherhood. But I felt very close to my daughter from the very beginning. So the sacrifices that I had to make it, it was it was totally worth it for me because you know, I was I was there for every single day, every single milestone. I've seen every single development in my daughter's life so far. So it's definitely worth it. You, I love how outspoken you are about all these things. As actually one of the reasons I wanted to interview you, because I was like, there's so many things that she just says exactly how she's thinking about them, and and it's it's awesome. But I love, whoops, that was the sound that the chair was not supposed to make. <laughs> I I love that you mentioned the whole thing about you know you loved your independence and you loved your me time because I think very often when and I've I've met women to whom when I say that I'm like I'm gonna be real with you like I'm just. I'm a little bit nervous because I really like my me time. I really like my time with my husband. And I know that having a child obviously is going to change quite a few things. And I get very mixed reactions. Some women say, well, that's just selfish. And I think to myself, I know it sounds selfish. And I obviously understand that when I have a child, if I continue to just, you know, oh, all I want is me time. I don't want to spend any time with my child. Maybe that'll be a little bit selfish. But I love that you said that you were that way, like you loved your independence. And that's what made you nervous. I think a lot of uh, women who are listening to this who don't have children yet, but want to have children, will find some comfort in what you just said. You know? Yeah, yeah. I think it's okay to say that. I think that there are actually, I, I kind of get frustrated sometimes with a lot of the rhetoric online about motherhood and women should become mothers. I do think more women should become mothers. But I also think that in many circles online, we are not being honest enough. And it's right. okay to be nervous. It's okay to, to to just be a little bit concerned about whether am I going to like motherhood? How am I going to juggle everything? It's a real concern. And I think the more we can be honest with ourselves and the more that we can voice these concerns with the people that we love, the people that we're close to, I think that we have a greater chance of navigating it once the time comes. This is why I think it's really important for young women to to become friends with older women or women who have multiple children. I think it's good for women to spend time around moms. And I wish I had done that a little bit more before I had kids. Now that I have a child, I spend a lot of time with moms and I make an effort to spend time with moms at our church, for example, who have like six kids and their oldest kid is like 18 years old. There's just so much to learn from them. And you get to see that things change. You get to see that all of these things in early motherhood are so temporary. And it just, it becomes less of a scary unknown territory and becomes a little bit more familiar. And it kind of gives you a little bit more assurance and confidence that you're going to figure it out. But there's nothing wrong with being nervous and honest and being like, hey, you know, I like to go on dates with my husband. I like to make sure because I'll tell you in the first couple of months, it was a struggle to like do my hair and put my makeup on. Yeah. And that's okay. We got to be honest with moms. In the first two, three months, it can be it can be really tough in the beginning and you almost do lose a sense of yourself and that's okay i think honestly that is one of 
the most important parts of motherhood is that you do have to lose a little bit of yourself and what you gain is so much more worth it. But we do need to be more honest and tell these women that it's going to be tough in the first couple of months. But you have to navigate it by having good communication with your husband, by having a good support network. That's something we don't talk about enough. You got to have good friends. You got to have a village of women who are going to be there for you and support you and help you with meals. I had people bringing meals to my home in the first six weeks of my daughter's life. Game changer. So it's good to talk about these things. You're kind of really making me want to move down south to U.S. because I feel like not everywhere, of course, but in many places, especially like in Canada, and I'm sure it's like that in some places in U.S. I know that U.S. is like from state to state is such a different world, right? Mm-hmm. Canada is a little bit more the same across the, across all provinces, uh, which is like the equivalent of the states. But I found so I'm I come from an Eastern European mainly Slavic background. And for us, the community around a family unit is very strong. And when somebody, for example, when there's a couple and, you know, they're about to become parents, there's usually that sense of like, okay, well, the whole village needs to like, just help, you know, and gather around them and help because it takes so many people to raise a child. Like they say, it takes a village, right? And I found in Canada, unless you are a member of a church or unless you make a huge effort to build a community around you, which is not always the easiest thing to do, especially if you live, you know, in a big city where there's uh, a very like corporate oriented culture, so to speak, everyone's kind of in their own bubble. Yeah. And there's definitely a lack, a major lack of that sense of community. And I'm curious, you know, you you said people were bringing you food. Um, Is that sort of like a more, I guess, common thing in in the South, in U.S., that you have more of that community centralized situation when somebody has a child? Yeah, that's a great question. It's something that I've been talking a lot more about online because I think that, you know, as Americans, it's it's no secret that we're some of the least traveled people in the world and we live in our own bubble. And then we live within a bubble within a bubble, our own state within the United States. And I think sometimes Americans forget that we have a very hyper individualized society. And yeah. that feature of American society, it there there are there are good things about it and there are definitely some downfalls that come with it. And I think one of the ways that Americans have suffered a lot from this hyper individualization is a lot of mothers have felt very isolated and very alone during pregnancy, birth, postpartum, raising young children, educating young children, even caring for the home. It can feel very isolating. And so I actually understand why a lot of young women are not interested in motherhood because they see these moms struggling. These moms are losing themselves. They're a shell of themselves because they have no support. So I think this is a really important topic. I think it does depend on where you live. And because Americans are so diverse in culture and ethnicity, it's harder to find these cultural pockets of communities that support one another that are not religiously connected. That makes sense. So my mom, for example, my mom is from South Korea, born and grew up there. And she was telling me that when she was young in her village in South Korea, all of the moms were constantly talking to each other. They would have meetings to help figure out how to help a mom whose child was sick. They would get together and figure out this mom is struggling to nurse her child. She's not producing enough breast milk. They knew which of the other moms were breastfeeding. My own grandmother used to nurse some of the other babies because she had enough breast milk and their mothers weren't producing enough. And they would bring food if someone was sick. They would go help if someone had just given birth. This is how a lot of cultures still are today, Eastern European, Eastern European, East Asian cultures. This is just how a lot of people live today. In America, it's, again, very hyper-individualized, and a lot of that comes from the American dream. The American dream of the white picket fence, the suburban life where dad goes to work at the office nine to five, the mom is home with the kids every day, and she cleans and she vacuums. It's that 1950s idyllic period where we all kind of want to go back to. But that 1950s period was quite isolating for a lot of moms. And I think if you find communities today in the United States, they're most likely church or religious communities that support one another. So when my daughter was born, both of my parents were really sick with COVID. 
my mom was put into the ICU two days before my daughter was born. I, I gave birth to my daughter thinking my mom was going to die. Oh, um, the church that we were attending, they rallied around us and they signed up to bring us meals every single night because I was just drowning. I was, it was so stressful, stressful enough bringing your first child into the world. And, you know, I was trying to make sure that my mom was going to live. My dad was also very sick. We had to take him back and forth to the hospital. You know, they're fine now. They survived and we obviously got through it, but I don't think we would have survived without the church community. So if you look at the the the, the different states in the U.S., it is more common to find strong church communities in the South. That is true. Um, in a lot of other states, you're, you're less likely to find these communities. Um, but in the States, you either have to find like strong communities that have a cultural or ethnic tie to one another, or you have to find a religious community. And those are going to be the places where you can find a lot of help. But it's becoming more and more rare to even have like a group of women who live in a neighborhood or who live nearby one another who aren't necessarily related ethnically or religiously that help each other. It's just so hard to find. And I think it's it makes me sad when I hear so many women DM me online and they're like, I'm struggling. I, I just I can't get any help. It's so hard to make friends with other women and other moms. And that's not how it should be. Motherhood was never meant for us to do it alone. Yeah, for sure. I, I I think so too. I mean, it's, I've seen benefits of having others around. I mean, I'm not a mother, but I've seen benefits of other mothers who had other mothers around them when they gave birth, or at least women who, mm, I guess maybe have been mothers for a long time. And it's just, it's, it's a whole other ball game. I feel like when you have that support for sure. And, you know, I think when it comes to, I, I was talking actually yesterday with somebody on my podcast about that. Uh, postpartum depression. Mm. I'm curious to know your thoughts about it because I know you mentioned, you know, the first couple of months are really tough, but I was talking about um, about this with my guest and she said uh, that it amazed her how little women are able to even admit to themselves and others that they had it or that they're going through it. It's almost like something that they want to be quiet about and silent about because there's so much guilt attached to it. Mm. What are your thoughts on that? Postpartum depression is becoming more and more common, I think. And there are a lot of factors that I think have contributed to the rise of it. Uh, I think, first of all, um, I think that the way that a lot of women give birth is traumatic today. I think because the conventional medical system has kind of sullied the way that a lot of women give birth and they have, we have a lot of these medical doctors, not all, I gave birth in a hospital. I had a wonderful experience, but I carefully chose my OB and it was it was a wonderful experience, but I completely understand why a lot of women are doing home births now because there are so many more stories of women who go to give birth and they're coerced into getting induced or getting a C-section or they feel bullied into vaccinating their children or whatever it might be. And it's a traumatic experience. And I think a lot of times women will internalize that and they don't know what to do with it. They don't have an outlet. So they suffer from postpartum depression. So that's one factor. It's not this that not may not be the case for every single mom. But then I think that two other things that are really contributing to it is the lack of community, like we were talking about. Um, a lot of times these these moms, they go home with this child. And yeah, you want to be alone. You want some privacy with your new baby. That's I mean, I, I enjoyed the privacy, but they have no help. So all of a sudden life has to go back to normal. In most cases, husband has to go back to work. So you're home all day. You have to cook. You have to clean. You have to resume life just all of a sudden. And it's it's scary because you have this baby and they don't send you home with a manual. You just have this baby and you're like, right. oh my gosh, what do I do? How, how often do I feed them? How often do I change them? Am I allowed to give them this? Am I What am I supposed to do? And it's scary. And then it becomes all the stress. So you don't have the support. But then I also think the third biggest factor is so many women are – they have underlying health issues that they don't know about that makes it harder to fully recover from birth. Um, I think especially in Western American society now, the the idea of what it means to be healthy is not actually healthy. So a lot of women are just pumping themselves full of endocrine disruptors every single day, whether it's through the food that they eat or the toxins in their makeup or in their clothes or even in their furniture or 
just, you know, the pollution that we're inhaling every single day. And so their, their hormones and their endocrine distress, endocrine system is severely disrupted. And of course, that's going to make it harder for your body to re reach a level of equilibrium after pregnancy and birth. So a lot of women don't know this, but the six weeks after birth is some of the most rapid hormonal changes that you experience throughout pregnancy, birth, and postpartum. Because the the estrogen levels, everything just goes crazy because your your body is trying to reset in a short amount of time. If you think about pregnancy, nine months is kind of a long time. And your body has that full nine months to gradually change its hormones. Your belly gradually gets bigger. But with postpartum, the baby is out of you in a second. And then your body is left scrambling, trying to figure out how it's going to get back to its pre-pregnancy self. So a lot of women that don't know that they're filling their bodies with endocrine disruptors, it makes it harder for them to, to, to reach that pre-pregnancy state again. And that can result in a lot of mental health issues, anxiety, depression. And in some places, in some cases, it can send women to, into a sort of psychosis. So I think there are a lot of factors that most of them are preventable, but we have to be able to address them and talk about them first. Um, unfortunately, like you said, I think there is a lot of guilt and shame around postpartum depression because it's already a very vulnerable time. And let's not forget the physical changes, of course, that happen in your body during pregnancy and birth. And you look down, you're like, I don't recognize this body. It can be honestly, can sometimes be kind of disgusting. You and it's it's hard, especially if you're a woman who's fit and healthy and you love your body. You look down and for a while it's unrecognizable. That's a scary thing. It's okay to say that. Um, but we're not talking about it enough. So a lot of women make themselves feel like they're crazy when they're really not. So I think a lot of it can be prevented. And I think a lot of it starts with just having some conversations and especially looking at the the conventional medical system and being able to point out what went wrong there and also identify what we're really doing that is resulting in in less than desirable health. Yeah. I think the subject of birth giving and the process which you can take to give birth is definitely a really interesting one. I've known women who chose to do home birth just because they were like I'm not going to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Like there's no way. And I have heard many times from women that um hospital birth very often contributes to postpartum depression. I have heard that many times, actually. It's it's very interesting. But this all ties into another subject that I really wanted to discuss with you, kind of relates to the hormones, which is birth control. Hmm. I've been discussing it more and more on my, on my podcast, and I want to continue discussing it because I'm finding more and more people who have had very negative experiences with it, but they were never advised, and I had that as well. Um, what what was your experience with it and how did you come to the conclusions that you came? I love this topic. I talk about birth control a lot. I call myself a birth control pill disrespecter. Um, I think it's one of the biggest disservices given to women today. I was 19 years old when I first was put on hormonal birth control. Um, and I was put on it because I just had heavy periods and, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't even sexually active at the time. I just went with my girlfriends in college. It was our second year of college, I think, um, second or third year. I went with my girlfriends. The four of us, we went, we were like, we're going to go get birth control. It was like the thing to do. Um, you know, we were, you know, watching like Sex in the City episodes and it just seemed so glamorous at the time. And there was very little uh, awareness of what hormonal birth control was. And so we went to the, to the, clinic at our university. And I just told the doctor about my period and it was heavy and um, painful. And I found it hard to concentrate during my menstrual cycle. And they just gave me hormonal birth control. And within six weeks, I think I just had two cycles. Uh, within six weeks, I started to feel the symptoms of a heart attack. I I didn't know what was going on. I just woke up one morning. I think it was a Wednesday morning. I woke up in my room and I sat up and I walked to my closet, which was probably eight feet away from my bed. And my heart felt like it was going to beat out of my chest. And I had shortness of breath and I started freaking out. I'm like, I've never had this before. I called my mom. I said, mom, what is, I don't know what I'm feeling. She said, just go to the student clinic. 
just go to see the doctor. Um, you just, you know, it could be, I don't know, anxiety. She said, whatever it is, just go to the clinic. I went to the clinic and they ran an EKG on my heart and the nurse came out and told me that I was fine. I just needed to go home and sleep. I was like, okay. In the back of my mind, I didn't think that sounded right, but I went back to my room and I got a phone call from a number I didn't recognize, but I answered it. I felt compelled to answer it. And it was a doctor from the clinic. And he said, I, he apologizes. I'm so sorry that I wasn't able to see you today because it was a really busy day, but I just looked at your chart and I think you might be having a pulmonary embolism. He said, I would take yourself to the emergency room right away. And I was terrified that I went, it was in the evening. I went to the ER. I waited in the room for like five hours. They ran all these tests, took a CT scan, and it turned out I had abnormally large blood clots lodged in my lungs. And oh. they said that if I had just waited several more hours, the blood clots would have likely traveled to my brain or my heart and caused a deadly stroke or heart attack. Um, so I was admitted into the hospital for a pulmonary embolism. And it was terrifying. This is like two in the morning on a weeknight. I'm a, a sophomore or a junior in college. And I had no idea what's going on. They were like, are you a smoker? We you know what, what's going on. They asked me about my family history. And I said, I don't know. And they finally came to the conclusion they guessed that it was the birth control because there was really no other explanation. I was an, an otherwise very healthy young woman. There was nothing else going on with my health. Uh, so I was hospitalized for three days and I was put on blood thinning medication for uh, a few months. And every couple of weeks I had to go in and, and give blood and get labs done. And uh, and it was it was a horrifying experience. I had to pause a lot of my classes. I had to be on bed rest for a couple of weeks. I had to give my sh myself shots twice a day. My mom had to come up to my university to stay with me and help cook for me and stuff. And I was really active in mock trial. And I had to back out of this huge tournament that we had been planning for for months. I had been working on. So it really disrupted my school year in a lot of ways. And of course, it disrupted my health. I was put on the blood thinners for a few months and I gained a lot of weight. I was very fatigued. Um, I missed out on a lot of the normal things that you would do as a college student. I got, I was addicted to marijuana. I was smoking weed every single day because I was depressed. I was upset that this happened to me. Um, and then, you know, that was a long time ago. That was 14 years ago. And they gave me, they, they kind of gave me a hint. They said, listen, one day, if you want to have children, you're going to have to be careful because once you have a risk of pulmonary embolism, once, once you've had a PE before, you have a, a much higher risk of having it again when you're pregnant. And I was 19 at the time and I was like, whatever, I'm not really, I think about that now. I have no interest in having kids anytime soon. Um, and so long story short, when I became pregnant with my first daughter, I went in to the doctor and they automatically categorized me as a high risk pregnancy. And I had to be, I have to take blood thinning shots through my pregnancy every single day because there is a much higher risk of a PE when you're pregnant, if you've had a previous PE. Now, is there a, how how high is the chance that I'm going to have another blood clot during pregnancy? We just don't know. But it's one of those things where you can't risk it because if you don't take the blood thinning shots and if you do have a blood clot, it's an instant miscarriage and it's very dangerous for your health. So that incident not only kind of turned me on to what the dangers of birth control are, but in many ways, it robbed me of my chance to have a natural uh, birth that was completely without any medical intervention because I have to be closely monitored during my pregnancy and my birth because there is such a high risk of PE. I don't know if you had heard of that story of Serena Williams, a tennis player. She also had a history of pulmonary embolism. When she gave birth to her first daughter, she unfortunately had to have a C-section and she ended up having a pulmonary embolism right after her surgery and nearly died from it. So it's just one of those things where it's a very scary thing. And when you're a high-risk pregnancy, they treat you like you are potentially about to die. <laughs> right. Um, so it was just, it was an awful experience all around. Having said all that, as the years went on, I started to research more about birth control. I was writing for some women's publications online, and I was interviewing a lot of doctors and reading a lot about the pill. And it occurred to me just how dangerous this pill is to women. Um, 
And you, as you know, it shuts down the ovulation the, your, because it shuts down the connection between your brain and your ovaries, which is not healthy, ladies. You need to ovulate. It doesn't matter if you don't want to have kids or if you want to have kids in five to 10 years. Ovulation is incredibly important for our health, our mental health, physical health, metabolic function, everything. Ovulation is very important. Uh, you also don't have a, a true period on the pill. You have something called a withdrawal bleed. Um, much higher rates of mental illness. It ruins your gut, severely depletes you of many, many nutrients that you need to survive and causes weight gain and all of these things that we don't want as women. And it just drives me crazy that this drug is touted as an empowering thing given to women when in actuality, I think it has led to the destruction of millions of women's lives and somebody should be held accountable for it, but they never will. And it does bring me hope that we're seeing this new movement of a lot of women who are speaking out against birth control and how it's ruined their health and ruined their life because women have been lied to. We've been told that there is no other way to successfully prevent pregnancy or to successfully manage our menstrual cycle. That's a lie. There are much healthier, more natural, and just as effective ways to do both of those that don't involve a group one carcinogen that is going to override your natural hormone cycle. So I use a lot of my time online now to help educate women just how horrible the pill is for them. Yeah. And I think there's a difference. And I, I, I've seen you speak about this. You know, it does have some benefit when it comes to medical conditions. Like I know, you know, endometriosis, I'm not a medical professional, so I'm not going to, you know, claim that I know exactly what it does or whatever, but I know that I have some friends who have had endometriosis and they take birth control. But it's kind of scary to me how, you know, I moved to Canada and I was two months away from turning 17. And I've shared the story before on my podcast, but I just went to the doctor because I've never in my life had acne. I was one of those lucky teenagers who has never had any acne. I had like porcelain skin. And then I moved to Canada and, you know, I moved from Eastern Europe where the weather was, I don't know, probably more similar to something like New York. So we had like all four seasons, but it wasn't like Siberia type of cold. And then I moved to pretty much the equivalent of Siberia type of cold, which is Canada, you know, the province of Alberta. And it's a huge change, right? Like I just moved across the globe. There's lots of stress. Who knows what happened? And I go to the doctor and panic because all of a sudden I started getting acne. He says, oh, don't worry about it. I'm going to prescribe birth control. So he prescribes the birth control. Me not knowing, you know, at almost 17 years old what it is, not looking into it. I'm like, birth control, great, you know, sure. I ended up taking it for seven years and I was psychotic by the end of, by the end of it. Psychotic. I'm talking like depressed. I was just, my reaction to things was mm. so weird. And I was feeling all sorts of health issues. Like I was bloated all the time, I, everything that you could list. And the only risk I was advised of was blood clot. And then, you know, I was talking to my other friends who have had similar experiences with birth control. And they were like, yeah, the only health risk we were advised when it was prescribed to us with blood clots, which is a you know high enough risk, of course, but it seems like all these other mental issues or mental health issues that come with it are just neglected. Nobody tells you about them. And I remember going to my doctor and telling him, Hey, I think, I think my birth control is messing me up. I don't, I don't feel myself. He said, Oh, let's just prescribe a lower dose. You know, so it's, it's, I think at this point it's a disservice to women mm -hmm. and, you know, Jokes on us because we feel all empowered when we take it, but really it kind of messes us up, you know? It messes us up. It makes I was in my like most masculine era when I was taking my birth control. Yes. I was feeling like yes. I don't want to have kids, like I yep. just I'm gonna work in the corporate for the rest of my life. I'm gonna climb the corporate ladder. And then when I went off of it, I was like, wait, I, I kinda kids are great. Maybe maybe I should you know <laughs> yeah. maybe I should this corporate world thing, I don't know. I mean it's great, but is that something that like it's just it's so interesting how that changed and it's mm. scary almost how much of an effect it has on you. Yeah. So it's 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 an interesting conversation and and I know that a lot of people find it controversial, which is so interesting to me. I'm like, this is women's health. Why is this a controversial thing? We should be talking about it more. We should be asking people who have had experiences with it because you know the the most the biggest thing I always get is, well, you're not a medical professional. You're not qualified yeah. to talk about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and yeah, that, but that's related. My body so got messed up, so <laughs> yeah, and yeah. we should be hearing women's voices. And this relates so much to the God complex that's been given to doctors. 
So mm. doctors are the only ones who are allowed to say anything about medication or health or whatever. And we forget, in the States at least, we forget that at the medical schools, these doctors are learning from textbooks that have been published and uh, and okayed by big pharma. So yes. that in and of itself is a huge red flag. And so when we probably when we were younger and given birth control, that time period is when there was very little distrust in doctors. We were yes. we thought that doctors were the last resort to ask any questions and they knew everything. We should just listen to whatever your doctor says. And we've finally a lot of us have finally come to realize that's not the case. Not to say the doctor all doctors are evil. Um, there are, of course, good doctors out there who want to actually help women, but we have to understand the nature of the system. And it's so frustrating that a lot of times people's response is, well, you're not a doctor. Okay, well, instead of telling me what my degrees are or what my degrees aren't, why don't you respond to the actual substance of what I'm saying? Because you don't need a medical degree. Whoever's listening to this, you do not need a medical degree to read studies, to understand research, to do your own uh, to do your own research and, and learn and educate yourself, you do not need an, an MD to do that. And it's just such, it's an, it's insulting to women it to is. tell us it that is. we can't learn for ourselves just because we didn't go to medical school. It is. Yeah, I agree with you. Did you hear, um, and I don't, I'm not going to be able to pull up a study, but I've seen it on numerous occasions and articles that women have like a higher degree um, of attracting the wrong partner when they are on birth control yes isn't that insane Crazy. oh my god i know and did you hear how women are more likely to be attracted to women when they're on the pill than they're attracted to women like the pill has a way of turning turning women bisexual uh there's this you may have heard of her she's a psychiatrist named dr sarah hill and she's done a lot of research and she, she wrote a book. I think it's called Your Brain on the Pill or something like that. But you can look her up, Sarah Hill. And she has done a lot of writing about how the pill will not only change the way that you smell to, to men, it'll change the way that men's pheromones smell to you. And it'll change who you're attracted to. You're much more likely to be attracted to women, which is like so bizarre. Wow. That is so interesting. It's oh, crazy. Yeah, it's I think it's one of the most fascinating subjects to me and I want to keep discussing it and obviously keep spreading the word and especially, you know, with women who have had experiences with it. Um, I'm glad that you, you're fine. I'm glad that, you know, obviously things are going well for you now. And how long were you on it? Uh, how long was that period of time between when you went, went on it and then you had all the issues? It up? was, I think just six weeks. It's very short. Oh, wow. Very short amount of time. There was actually, with the particular birth control I was using, there was a class action lawsuit because there were so many women that got blood clots from it. Yeah. So it was it was a very short amount of time. Um, so it didn't take long. And a lot of people say, oh, well, the birth control that they have now is a lot safer. I'm like, but is it? I think that the statistics they tell us, they tell us that statistically 0.01% of women will get blood clots on the pill, or maybe it's 0.1, which is kind of a big difference, but it's, you know, it's much less than 1%, they say. And I think that's a lie. I do. I think that that, that statistic, call me a conspiracy theorist, I don't care. That is a, a, a fabricated statistic because I have talked to so many women who have had blood clot issues, pulmonary embolism, um, deep vein thrombosis, like all of these things that come from the pill. And you're telling us that only 0.1% of women who take the pill get it? Yeah, I don't think so. I think that's a lie. I think it's much more common than they want us to believe it is. Well, and I wouldn't be surprised if they specifically, yeah, exactly, they, they kind of cover it up, right? Because that's that'd be a lot more convenient, right? Yes. To cover it all up and not release the, which is why probably we're getting flack for speaking up about right. some of the stuff that we've experienced, right? But uh, what about Gina? I wanted to touch on the subject of, you know, you obviously do a lot of social media work these days and you share, we've talked about how you're very outspoken about, you know, your experiences and all that kind of stuff. How did you get into that? Is that something that you've always kind of wanted to do or how did you embark on that journey of social media and spreading the word about all the things? Yeah, I, uh, years ago, I originally just started online doing fitness content. Um, is that your background? Yeah, that's me. Yeah, that's yeah. sort of my background. In 2013, so a long time ago, I did my first yoga teacher training certification. 
Um, and I traveled the world teaching yoga. Um, I haven't done yoga in a really long time, but that was my first step into the world of fitness. And then got really into CrossFit and strength training. And I became a strength and fitness coach, strength and conditioning coach when I was in California. And that's what I did pretty much full time. Um, so I started on social media by sharing a lot of fitness content. Um, and at the time I was not posting anything culturally or, you know, cultural or political. Uh, but about 2017 was the year when I started to rethink a lot of things. And that's the year that uh, I started, I decided to to start posting a little bit more. That was also around the time in 2019, I started working for Candace Owens. I don't know if you've ever heard of her. Oh, yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I worked for her for a couple of years. I first started as her manager and helped her with her nonprofit organization. And of course, working with someone as outspoken as Candace, it, it, it definitely... Uh, inspired me to be a little bit more outspoken online. Um, and then I left that job when I had my daughter because I wanted to be able to be home with her and spend time with her. But um, that's kind of the the progression. I started as fitness, but then I, I would say the transition was I started to talk about body positivity. That was sort mm-hmm. of my first entryway into becoming more outspoken online because in the fitness world, I was seeing a lot of these mixed messages Because at the time, I was also writing for some women's publications, writing fitness and health content. And I saw a lot of editors would would, uh, censor a lot of the things that we were writing about health. They would censor the things that we would write about obesity. They would take out certain information. For example, a colleague of mine was writing an article about PCOS. And she Mm -hmm. wrote about how if you're obese... Losing weight and becoming more metabolically healthy can help reduce the symptoms of PCOS. And our editorial director deleted that from the article because it was too offensive. Oh, um, wow. oh, wow. Yeah. So I saw a lot of that. And then I, so I started to speak out against body positivity because it was, you know, this was around the time where Tess Holiday, for example, was on the cover of Cosmopolitan. Um, and we were just seeing a lot of morbidly obese women who were talking about health at every size. It doesn't matter what size you are. And it was really frustrating because I had a lot of overweight women who were coming to me online looking for help and guidance and, you know, watching the obesity rates significantly rise and what that does to women's hormones and women's fertility. So that's how I actually met Candace because I reached out, uh, to to be a guest on her podcast. And I was on her show in 2019 and we met and then I ended up working for her. Um, and then through that time was when I, I started to build up social media a little bit more and sort of ended up where I, where I am now. Body positivity started like such a great idea and then it just went way too far. It did. Just like many things in, in the Western world these days. Like the initial idea was great. Why did we have to go so far? Why did we have to just spread lies, you know, at, at this point? I know. Um, I kind of started to poke some fun at the modern day 2023 Western feminism, like the feminism that we have in the Western world. And uh, I got canceled and then I'm canceled because I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like, you can't cancel me. <laughs> I keep saying stuff like this is not going to. And, you know, I always make fun of like the North American, um, which, by the way, when I say North American, I, I'm not talking about Mexico. I know Mexico is technically North America, but it's not right. it's not really North America. You right. know, it's, it's um, but U.S. and Canada and the Western world, I, I broke a lot of fun of the whole being offended thing, because back where I come from, people just don't get offended. Like it's it's very rare for somebody to get offended. You can say whatever you want to me. I'll just either dismiss it or just, you know, it's, you don't have to let anyone's words right. affect you, right? especially to the extent of normalizing something that is objectively speaking, a lie and an unhealthy thing, you yes. know? Yeah. So it's, it's very, it's it's very interesting how that turned, and I'm I'm still trying to analyze why that happened because I obviously there's a reason why I live in North America and I moved here. There's certain things that I love about this place, a lot of things that I love about this place, America and Canada, but some of these things just get a little they're too much. Yeah, I think a lot <laughs> of it has to do with people are just so spoiled and entitled they will yep. find anything to be offended at because in 
in Korean culture, for example, like if someone is if someone is gaining weight and they're starting to look unhealthy, your family members will tell you directly. directly. Yes, same with us. Yes. <laughs> yeah, right. I know. And I've heard same with a lot of Eastern European cultures too. Like, and yeah. they tell you that because they love you and they don't want you to, be, they don't want you to be fat because it's not good for yes. you. Yes, exactly. So, and what's wrong with that? Like, it, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I know. I know. Yeah. yeah. I heard you or I've seen you um, talk a lot about the importance of, for lack of a better word, not letting yourself go as a mother. Can we can we hone into that a little bit? Because I think a lot of a lot, I've met a lot of women who, you know, I, I knew a woman who has four kids. Actually, two women have four kids and they look fabulous. They take such good care of themselves. And they both said to me, like, yeah, with each and every one of my kids, there are more and more things that I found that I need to improve on. There's even more care that I need to put in myself. And you kind of have a very similar outlook on that. What advice would you give to somebody who's maybe listening to this? And, you know, I hate using that word because it's just getting triggered uh, by the fact that, you know, these two women are, are, are talking on podcast. One isn't even a mother. Another, you know, is has done all this great work and they're just lucky that they have all this time and stuff like that. What, what advice would you give to somebody if they made it this far into the episode and didn't get offended to <laughs> close it and then go on our social media accounts? Right. And- yeah. If they made it yeah. this far, you know, good on them because they're at least open to it. You know, I think the biggest, well, first of all, I think that there's a little bit of a misconception when we talk about not letting yourself go as a mom. I am not saying that you need to look like Jennifer Lopez after every single child. I'm not saying that you need to be a perfect, perfect physique, size two. You don't need to go snap back to your pre-pregnancy genes within a couple of months. That's not what we're saying. Those are all, that's a sort of superficial way to approach. What we're saying is that becoming a mother should never be an excuse to let your health fall to the wayside. It should never be an excuse to lose your beauty, to to lose your your sacred feminine energy. It, it shouldn't be an excuse. If anything, this is the way I put it, being a mother is the very thing that motivates you to be your absolute peak health because there's so much more at stake. Before I had my daughter, I could, you know, I, you could binge eat on the weekend. Maybe you could just kind of be lazy and then like sleep in until 10 the next day. Like I can't do that now. Like I have to be much more careful about what I eat, about how I spend my time. I have to be careful about where I put my energy because there is this little child that depends on me for everything. So I think being a mom should be, and it can be used as the greatest motivator for us to take care of ourselves. And I think where it starts, if anyone's listening and if you know you want to be a mom one day, it starts now because it doesn't matter, not that it doesn't matter, but it matters less about what you do postpartum and it matters more about what you do before you're pregnant and during your pregnancy as well. Because I've talked to, I had a a friend of mine, she just had her second child and she told me after she had her first, because our first kids are very close in age. And she told me that she sort of like let herself go in her first pregnancy. She was like, oh, I'll just lose the weight after. A lot of moms have that approach, right? And she mm-hmm. said she regrets it because it is a lot harder to just sort of like, whatever, I'm pregnant. I'm just going to eat whatever I want because I'm pregnant and I have these cravings. It's a lot harder. Not that it's impossible to get back to where you were after pregnancy, but it's harder. So it all starts before you're pregnant. Start taking care of yourself now. Think very consciously about the the nutrient dense foods that you want to be eating prepare your body for pregnancy so that when you do become pregnant you you are a, a healthy host for a child and then as you go through the pregnancy continue eating well and exercising moving the body getting as much sleep as you can so that when postpartum comes not that it's easy but it's not as hard as it would be that's the first first piece of advice i would give is it really starts before you're pregnant and this is why it, it it kind of it makes me sad when I see a lot of women who are like they're single, but they know they want to get married and have kids in the next five years, and they're like, whatever, I'm just gonna go and binge drink and eat whatever I want. I'm like, don't do that. Prepare your body, you know. Right. Treat yourself right. Not that you can't go out and have fun. Yeah, go out and have fun, but don't don't bombard your body every single weekend with all these toxins and alcohol and and overeating bad foods, like it all starts before you're pregnant. Um, 
And then after you're a mom, you have to find ways to prioritize taking care of yourself. And I just posted something on my Instagram yesterday about how the biggest mistake that I see moms make when it comes to fitness is they have this all or nothing approach. They think that a workout doesn't count unless they do something high intensity, unless they sweat for an hour. Oh, well, you know, I can't work out for an hour today, so I might as well not do it. No, if you have 15 minutes, go for a walk. That's it. You have to do the best with what you're given. And sometimes there are days where you don't have much, you don't have much free time or you may not even have much energy, but you have to find a way to move the body. And so I think the sort of all or nothing approach is not helpful for moms. We have to, we have to plan ahead. We have to be proactive and we have to find the little pockets of the day that we can take care of our health and move the body, get outside with the kids as much as you can. And of course, eat a well-balanced diet. And the first thing I always tell moms is stop eating out so much. That's the first thing. Just stop eating out. Start cooking more so you know exactly what's going into your food. You're going to feel better. You're going to be a lot healthier. Your kids are going to sleep better and behave better if you're cooking them good, healthy food every day. And it will be a lot easier for you to have more energy and stay at a weight that you want to stay at. But I never – I remember when I – I visited Spain when I was – 19 or 20. And we were in Barcelona and I remember talking to somebody and they said that the concept of MILF is a joke to them because why would you ever not be beautiful as a mom? Like they were Mm. telling me that in Spain, it's like culturally they don't have this thing where like women get fat and unattractive after they have kids. They're like, why would that even be a thing? It's the same in Eastern Europe. I'm sure, you know, Eastern European women, like Russian women, they have a reputation of like, they're always looking glammed up, right? Always. Like, it's, it's always that, that idea that like, okay, you have the child, of course, but, but you have to take care of yourself. You have to look good yep. for everyone, yourself and everyone around you kind of thing, right? Yes. So yeah. It's yeah. good for everyone. It's good for your children. It's good for your husband, obviously. Um, again, yeah. no one's saying that you have to be glammed up all the time. You know, just a little bit of makeup, do your hair, you know, put something nice on and you don't have to be a size two. You just have to be healthy. And that's really all it is. And I think that so many moms feel like it's impossible, but it's really not. It's it's really not that hard once you get the habits in place and once you make a decision to take care of yourself. Um, I think it's really important for everyone involved, especially the kids. They need a healthy mom. Right. Well, that's the first example, right? Like when you're when you're growing up. And you look at your mom, that's like you copy everything your mom yes. does. So if anything, I agree with you. I, I think it'll set a really healthy habit and pattern that the child will adopt from from the mother. Yeah. You mentioned, you know, this idea of letting yourself go. And that's something that also the amount of times I have said, like I always post like on my social media, like go work out, you know, mo- motivating thing for especially for women, go work out, go to the gym put effort into yourself, wear makeup, look good for yourself, for your husband, whoever, just, just look good. And most of the time the reaction is great because my followers are, you know, the vibe with me, but there are times when I'll get like, Oh my God, you're just promoting unhealthy beauty standards. And I'm like, no, no. Going to the gym, eating well, putting effort in yourself is promoting unhealthy beauty standards. What the hell happened to (laughs) y'all? They act like you're some kind of Kardashian. That's like getting butt implants (laughs) and like, Oh my gosh, no. Like it's this crazy. is not unhealthy beauty sense. No. I've had work done. Like I've had some plastic surgeries and stuff like that, but I don't promote them. I don't promote them. I'm right. honest about them. If people ask me, right. I don't go online and I say, Hey, in order for you to be beautiful, you need to go do this and this type of stuff. No, 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 not at all. But going to the gym, eating well, putting a little bit of effort into, you know, looking well or put together is objectively speaking, a healthy beauty standard. Yes. And you know, it's, it's, it's so funny to me how, they're trying to change like the beauty formula. You know, there's a beauty, there's a formula to beauty. There's a formula to, to looking good. We're attracted to beautiful looking things. Of yes. course, we all have different tastes, but there's nothing wrong with it. Beauty, it's funny to me how- beauty is good for the world. And this is something yeah. that Western society has done very well. They've, they've killed beauty. They killed beauty and they've killed truth. It's like, you know, you, it, we've heard that beauty is inseparable from what is true and what is good. And so we mm. need more beauty in the world. And I think what moms and women get caught up in is they compare their beauty today to their beauty when they were 20 without kids. There's no need to mm. compare the two. You, It's not about, again, not about fitting into the jeans you wore when you were 
20 or 25. It's not about looking exactly the same, having the same skin. It's not about that. It's about being beautiful today. And I think that every woman has a sacred duty to bring beauty into the world. And again, I'm not talking about superficial beauty, but beauty that comes from within. And part of that is taking pride in the way that you look. And this is such basic stuff. Even in America, like a few decades ago, if you look at like the 50s and 60s, the photos, like women were always beautiful. They dressed yeah. nicely. They wore dresses. They had hats. They always went out with a little makeup on. And it's just ha- it's just the way that things were. And today you're called like some sort of bigot or sexist if you encourage that now. It's just, it's really, it's upside down is what it is. Yeah, for sure. Uh, my light went out. It, it's out of battery, so I'm not as well illuminated anymore. <laughs> but I took a picture. I was in Toronto um, two weeks ago or a week and a half ago. And there was a picture I saw from 19... 19- I think it was like 1935 or something. And there was a picture of the harbor and there was like so many men and women just walking and all of them were dressed so well and they all look so fit. I'm sure not all of them, you know, every day lifted weights in in the gym, but it was just the norm to Mm -hmm. probably eat a little bit differently, move around a little bit more and dress well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's pretty simple. It's, It's pretty simple. I agree with you. Well, and you also kind of, um, a, a, you, you appear to be a living um, evidence of it being possible as a mother, because I think you're right. I've heard a lot of women use it as an excuse, motherhood, to maybe stop taking care of themselves or not prioritize it enough, right? Mm-hmm. So I think the more we have women like you spread the word about it and lead by example, the, the better the better and the easier it'll be for women who are maybe going down the path of being scared of it or, or, you know, making those excuses. Yeah. So thank you so much, Gina, for your time. And thank thank you you. for, for coming on my podcast. I will link all of the socials and links in the captions so that our audience can find. And maybe we'll connect in the future in person. Yes, please come visit, come to Tennessee. When you come visit, we'll definitely get together and it'll be nice to meet you in person. Absolutely. Likewise. Yeah. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode. I will see you soon.